I move my cattle every day. I've got several different fields, and they rotate daily into fresh grass. Everybody thinks it's something new, but it's actually the way they did it in the 1800s. Uh, smaller fields give grass a chance to rest between grazings. Uh, I do what I think is best for the cattle and for the land so that I can keep doing it. I'm Brooks Fielder from Harrisburg, Kentucky, and I'm a rancher and farmer here in central Kentucky. Portions of Texas, including the South Texas brush country, there are still millions of acres of potentially suitable habitat for bobwhite quail. We're here an example of some really good quail habitat. We've got a good distribution of woody cover. We have a forbs, we have grassy cover, there's bare ground, all of the components that a quail need. People from all over the country will seek out hunting opportunities in places like South Texas, where cows and quail and native rangelands do very well side by side. In most of the eastern U.S., the native rangelands have been completely converted over to exotic forage grasses like fescue. And Kentucky is the epicenter of that. There's multiple problems with fescue as habitat for wild birds. It doesn't provide much vertical structure or quail and grassland birds to hide in. Fescue also provides a very poor food source. We are now realizing that there is opportunity to, to turn back the clock somewhat and replace that fescue with the native grasses that were eradicated decades ago. And the place we're standing now is one of those locations. And the birds are responding to that. So there's, there's government incentives. Uh, there's also government technical assistance from the Department of Agriculture or from the state wildlife agencies that have trained experts that can come out and provide technical advice to landowners on the steps to restore the native vegetation. Those, those cattle that you just seen going into that native grass pasture was going into eastern gamma grass. Uh, it is uh, one of the most palatable gra warm season grasses there is. The word's already getting out. Um, Neighbors are, are kindly implementing some of the practices. You know, we want our producers to be profitable, and that way they'll continue being good stewards of our land. But it, it's good for everything. It's good for the cattle, it's good for the environment, it's good for the wildlife. So why not do it? What you're seeing behind us is this is a pretty typical grazed pasture, predominantly fescue, tall fescue, a little bit of orchard grass, so heavily grazed. You'll see not a lot of cover. Uh, for quail, grass and songbirds, not a lot of good habitat there. You know, what we saw on the other farm, the Peebler farm, was really the exact opposite. Um, they've got a really strict rotational grazing regimen in place. They're allowing their grasses to get taller. Uh, it's providing some really good cover for wildlife. So it's really um, a stark difference between the two. Shaker Village is a nonprofit to set up to uh, continue the education about the Shaker way of life and their religion. They were a communal society. It got started here in Pleasant Hill in 1806 and lasted until 1910. The rock walls, the, the farming practices, everything they did was essentially built, built to last. Going along with the progressivism of the Shakers, we saw that traditional farming and cattle operation wasn't working for us. We uh, completely changed the landscape. We have uh, converted about 1,200 acres, converted to restore native prairies, so those warm season grasses and wildflowers. So it's hard to go anywhere on the property and not hear, hear birds singing or hear quail whistling. We embarked on a very ambitious project here. You can have excellent wildlife benefits, and you can also have economic benefits as well. And so they've been very successful. And it doesn't matter if it's a small plot on a small farm or if it's a big commercial operation, we can always come out and find something that will be workable within that landowner's interest. And our ultimate goal is we want high quality habitat on the landscape so that wildlife can thrive and also that the customers are happy too. We did this project for songbirds, grassland songbirds and wildlife that were in need. It did exactly what the quail folks wanted it to do. This field here is exactly what we're looking for in relation to having bunch grasses and a mixture of forbs when we're making quail habitat. Uh, much different than what we see on the typical landscape. My job is to coordinate the actions uh, of our entire agency and partners to restore bobwhite to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. 
And we've been doing that now for seven and eight years with some really good responses across the state. There's a lot of opportunity to integrate wildlife and agriculture. I think there's a lot of society that has a real interest in that happening. Restoration for quail and songbirds is, is a very high priority in Kentucky. You know, quail represent really an American tradition, uh, rural economies, uh, a rural way of life, a rural hunting heritage. I'm Gregory Johnson, Commissioner for Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. And there's a lot of other wildlife species that benefit from that besides just bobwhite quail. Uh, songbirds, uh, butterflies, and now there's a lot of emphasis nationwide on monarch butterflies. Uh, their habitat fits very well with quail. We're seeing a lot of our younger farmers now really embracing having a wildlife situation on their farm that they can intermix with either their grain operation or their cattle operation. And people all of a sudden feel very connected to the landscape here and once they understand the value to that and it, it touches their heart then they, they care about what it looks like and and what we can do and how can we make it better and so that's a real big part of the conservation puzzle.